I slowly covered my head, and tears were running down my face. I was so scared. Then I heard that same noise of that, that thing coming back into my room. Get ready, everyone, and grab your flashlight, because these five scary bedtime stories will give you nightmares tonight. Yesterday, I was celebrating a family member's birthday when I received a call from an aunt of mine. I had not talked to her in probably five or so years, so I was quite surprised when I heard her voice on the other line when I picked up. She seemed off, like something was bothering her, so I asked what was wrong. This is what she told me. Aunt Teresa, is everything okay? You seem... I don't know, off, or sad or something? I asked a little concerned. Kevin, I have to tell you something, and I know that you will believe me. I know you have had some paranormal things happen in your life, and I can't quite explain what is going on with me. It's really scaring me, so can you just listen for a minute? She asked, with sadness in her voice. Of course! I said, retreating into my laundry room for some privacy. This is when she began her horrifying experiences. My friend Diane came over about a month ago. She seemed very distressed and told me she hadn't been sleeping well because something was happening to her in the middle of the night. She went on to tell me these terrifying events and I have to admit, after she left, I felt a little creeped out to stay home alone. As much as I tried, I could not get my mind off from the things she told me. When it hit night time, I still didn't feel comfortable, so I decided to take a sleeping tablet to help me fall asleep. It worked, but not for long. Around 2 am, I woke up to an eerie silent house. I could hear the tick of my clock in the living room, but nothing else. I didn't feel like I was alone, but deep down, I knew. It was just from what Diane had told me earlier, so I rolled over to try and get some more sleep, and that's when I first noticed it. There was a heavy pressure on the other side of my bed, like someone was laying next to me. Bill was obviously long gone, and I don't live with anyone, Kevin. No animals or anything. This sent ice-cold shivers down my spine, and my heart was racing so bad, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I let out a little squeal as the tapping surprised me. It was after that tapping that my fears were confirmed. I felt the bed lift as whatever it was got out of my bed. Then the soft snuffle of very strange sounding footsteps leaving my room, like they were slowly dragging their feet. I laid there and started weeping, because I was beyond terrified. I thought whoever it was had left, so I slowly picked my head over at my door to see if I could see anything. At first, there was nothing, just my dark living room with a slight glow from the street lamp outside. Then I saw it. It ran very quickly past my bedroom door, toward my kitchen. It was huge, maybe seven feet tall, I don't know. I could hear my aunt's voice shaking at this point. Then he ran again, back the other way. I was paralyzed in fear. It looked like he had his arms behind him, like he was running too fast, and his arms could not keep up, just dangling behind him. They were very long too. I slowly covered my head and tears were running down my face. I was so scared. Then, I heard the same suffling of that, that thing coming back into my room. The pressure came back on my bed as he laid back down next to me. I was so afraid I didn't move. 
the exhaustion from the adrenaline must have kicked in, because next thing I know, I wake up and it's morning. I slowly look next to me and there was nothing at all. I felt a little relieved, so got out of bed and for some stupid reason, I choked it up to be a very vivid nightmare. After all, these things really don't happen to people. Around 6.30 p.m., I felt tired again and relaxed on my chair and eventually dozed off watching television. I woke up and it was in the middle of the night. I looked at the clock on my living room and once again it was about 2 in the morning and immediately all of the events from the prior night came racing back to my head and I sat there in silence. That's when I noticed the TV was off. I was sure I had left it on, but wasn't entirely sure, so I tried to calm myself. All I could think was how quiet it was, and that once again something felt very wrong. That same tapping noise from last night, and I knew, somehow just knew, not to move or make a sound. I hear my bed creak, and that same subtle noise as it came into the living room with me. I kept one eye slightly open and looked into the reflection of the TV, and I could not believe what I saw come out of my room. It was huge, Kevin. Just like the night before, it stood there and looked over my way, before it took off and ran to the kitchen. Then it came back into the living room and once again back to the kitchen. This was ungodly terrifying. After a few laps, he stopped a little way behind my chair and I could see him in the reflection of the TV, taking these giant exaggerated tiptoe steps right up to behind me. He smelled so awful like a dead deer carcass. In the reflection, I seen him get right up to about an inch from my eye and smile his nasty, disgusting ring at me. He knew I was awake and knew I was watching him. Two more nights, he joyfully whispered. Then he slowly shuffled back to my room and I heard the bed creak again as it laid back down. I stayed up the whole night jumping at every board creaking or any noise whatsoever. It was the longest night of my life. When it finally came to morning, I jumped up and called Diane as quickly as I could. She began to sob and apologize repeatedly to me. I asked why she was apologizing and she told me that the reason I was experiencing this is because of her. If you tell someone of this thing, it can sense it, passes it on, and it leaves you alone until it gets bored. Then, it will come back. I am so sorry, Kevin, that I told you this, but I didn't know what else to do. She began crying again at this point. I asked her why, why the hell she would tell me this, and basically, she says she can't live in this fear and that all I would have to do is tell someone about it and I should be fine. I honestly don't believe this is a real thing, but also, I work third shift, so at night I'm gone anyway. I do apologize if this is real and I somehow pass the curse. If it is real, just pretend you're asleep and pray you will be fine. I guess, to give my story some background, I'd like to inform you that I am somewhat of a hermit. Partly my choice, but mostly not by choice. I am an awkward guy and have never been that good at making friends. The day I decided to make a best friend was the day that I lost the only friend that I'd ever had. It was a few months ago and I had been living in a silent one-bedroom apartment I do freelance photography outside of my regular job. I don't like taking pictures of people. I mainly do animals and landscapes. 
Early that morning, I had received an email from a woman named Jo, who ran a puppy rescue in town. She said she needed good pictures of some of her puppies on the website. I jumped at the opportunity because, let's face it, even if I had friends, I'd still go spend the day with puppies. I spent about two hours taking pictures of puppies for Jo, and I had the most fun in a quite a while. There was this one dog that had been following me around all day. She kept saying she didn't want his picture taking and that he was scared of the camera. Joe kept saying that I was the only stranger that the dog has ever liked. The thought of that was flattering and boosted my self-esteem a little bit. When Joe offered me money to pay for the photo shoot, I declined. It was honestly nice to just get out of the apartment. She said that couldn't let me walk away empty-handed and then offered a free adoption. I chose the little weird puppy that had been following me all day long. Joe was almost brought to tears when everything was finalized. She said that we were perfect for each other. I wasn't sure if that was a compliment or not, but I didn't care. The first night was interesting. I offered to let him on my bed, but he was insistent on sleeping in front of the doorway. I didn't argue with him much. I was too tired to put up a fight. I settled in and fell asleep pretty quick. I was having some real bad nightmares, common for me since I have chronic nightmares. Here's to you, anxiety. I woke up to my dreams to feel my new puppy jumping on my chest with both front feet, as if he were trying to wake me up. Once I woke up, he walked to the edge of the bed and barked and growled at the doorway. I got up to check and see if there were any real danger. I walked through the hallway and into the living room, cautiously, turning on every light in the apartment. Although I found nothing dangerous in my apartment, my new dog kept growling and whining. When I went back to bed, he jumped up with me and plopped right at my feet facing the doorway. He turned back to look at me and then back to the doorway again. Before I fell asleep, I had named him Hector. The next day, I did not have work or any photo gigs, so Hector and I went cruising around looking for good photo ops for stock images. Hector proudly sat in the passenger seat while I drove. For the first time in forever, it felt like I had a real friend. We stopped at a fast food place for lunch, and unbeknownst to me, they give out little hot dogs for every dog in a car at the drive through It seemed as if luck was turning up for the both of us. I lost track of time and it got dark. On the way home, I found this park that had this really creepy looking bridge in it, so I decided to stop and check it out. When I got out of the car, Hector barked at me. He looked at me as if he was demanding me to get back in the car. Hey bud, I'm just going to take a couple pictures. It'll only take a few seconds, I promise. We'll be home before you know it, I assured him. He pawed towards the open driver's side door. Hector poked his head out and looked around before hopping out and taking a position right next to me. I turned on my camera and began to walk toward the bridge. I started to get the feeling that he knew something was strange. I think that's enough. This place is creepier than I thought. How about we head home, huh? I asked him, but Hector looked as if he didn't hear. His eyes were fixed on something at the end of the bridge, but I could not see what he was staring at. What you see, boy? I asked him again, received no acknowledgement. Hector? I harshly whispered to him. He turned his head and looked at me with big sad puppy eyes before he snapped his head forward and took off running to the end of the bridge. Shit, Hector! I yelled and took off running after him. I could not see him, but I could hear that he was barking and growling at something in the dark. 
I got about halfway over the bridge before I saw a figure step into the light. The figure was very tall and naked. The figure's skin looked greasy and waxy. It had three toes on each foot with sharp toenails. It stepped even more into the light and onto the bridge. The figure almost looked like a very sick man with spindly arms that were bony and scratched. He had eyes that glowed a hint of yellow. The figure's mouth was half cocked to the side, bearing a half smile that displayed sharp and crooked teeth. In one hand, he held Hector by the tail. He lifted Hector to his eye level and glanced at the helpless puppy. Then he turned back to me, innocent, sweet. The figure said in a voice that sounds as if he was drowning in sand. His sharp-toothed smile turned into a menacing grin. Tasty, he barked. No! I screamed before running towards the figure before he could eat my new best friend. The figure let out a horrifying scream before beginning to trot in my direction. I'll kill you, I'll kill you! I screamed at the beast. The beast gave me a good hit to the chest before grabbing the front side of my shirt as I desperately tried to catch my breath. He looked into my eyes with his. He stroked my cheek with his long sharp fingers. You! Tasty! He said while shoving hot monster breath into my face. The figure opened his mouth as wide as he could before his jaw started to dislocate itself until the gap in his mouth was just large enough to fit my whole head inside of it. Just then, a loud growl was heard from behind him, followed by a loud chomp. The monster's face twisted into agony that made his focus his attention at Hector, who had just torn the monster's foot off the bone. The monster howled in pain and grabbed Hector with one hand to lift him up again. I got up and began to push the monster backward towards the railing of the bridge. The monster tripped and stumbled his way towards the railing. Give me my best friend back! I screamed at the creature over and over again, continuing to push him further back. I had finally gotten him hanging over the edge of the rail. Give me my dog or I will kill you, I screamed at the creature. He began to laugh and smell the same evil grin. Brave, he said. There was a moment of stillness that made me uncertain of what was going to happen. The creature slowly started to slide his hands in my direction as if he was going to offer Hector back to me. I reached out to take Hector from him, but before I could, he shoved Hector into his mouth and began to chew. Hector let out a yelp before being crushed by these creature's razor-sharp teeth. No! The creature laughed, the hole down until he crushed hard on the surface below. I can't explain what I saw that night. I don't know what the thing was. I just know that he ate the only thing that ever really cared for me. The only thing that I ever cared for. One night, I went out of town for a family event. As I was driving back, I saw a statue that looked terrifying. I pulled over to see what it was. It was the statue of the creature that I saw on the bridge. There was a plaque at the base of the statue that read, Malum is a demon that haunts vulnerable people into adulthood until a proper sacrifice is made. The town of Whitestone, Texas celebrates a yearly festival. The city's residents lay baked goods at the base of this statue. So, I don't know where else to post this. Part of me wants to think that this was just a harmless night terror, but something's different about it. I recently got a job working the night shift as a hazmat tech at a factory. 
think glorified janitor that deals with industrial waste. Anyway, this means I sleep from early morning to midday, so I'm generally drifting off on my weekends at about 3 a.m. so I can run some errands during the day. I'm generally not one to be superstitious, though I do understand that there are some things that bring ease to our more primitive instincts and emotions, and some things that bring out our deepest unmanable fears. Runes, words, talismans, and such bring a tense of ease to certain people by acting as a placebo, and sound frequencies induce the sense of fear or terror due to some yet unknown evolutionary advantage. Plus, most accounts of the supernatural can be explained away scientifically or through float perceptions. So, yeah, I'm not generally one to believe in the boogeyman, or think a set of lines will have an effect other than a placebo or source for confidence boosting. Besides, that's all the point. Last night was rough. I'm still trying to process it. So, it's Saturday morning at 3 a.m. when I turn in. Expecting to run some errands early the next day, I drift off easily and I may have had a combination of 10 mg melatonin and a glass of wine to help get to sleep sooner. I had a dream soon after falling asleep. I'm with my boyfriend and we are walking along this hallway. It is in some factory, a lot of metal crates and pipes and equipment. We are walking along and helping each other over various obstacles, a hole in the floor here, a highlight there, it was dark and creepy, but I was comfortable and safe, because my love was by my side. This was an awfully realistic dream, I could feel the metal pipes under my hand with the rust and paint chip as I climbed over them. The air was cool and musty, and there was a sense that we should not be in this place, but there was never a feeling of danger. So, as we are walking in this dream, we come to a ledge that's about 6 feet tall. I climb on top of it and help pull my boyfriend up to the top, and I lose my balance as I pull him up. He ends on top of me in an accidentally intimidated position. I don't have a problem with this, and we kiss a little, cuddling on top of this catwalk we just climbed up onto. It felt very safe, and he felt so warm. Then. There's a scratching sound. He looks up at something further down the hall that I can't see and gasps. Suddenly, I feel like I had gone somewhere where I shouldn't be, and whoever is warden of the place has caught us. I can't move my head back enough to take a look, not that I'm trying to, because the man of my life, who I'm holding close, and has me pinned to the floor in a vulnerable position, no longer feels the same. He looks the same and acts the same, but something is off. His warm brown eyes are now harder and colder. This sense of safety is gone, and I have the distinct thought of this is the look of someone who can kill me without a second thought and think nothing of it. Something had gotten into the dream version of my boyfriend. I could sense it. His feel was different, the air felt drained of any positive energy, and something worse was drawing closer, out of sight. And then, my not boyfriend spoke. Would you look at that? It's so beautiful, he whispers, after a moment looking up at something that's growing closer and sucking the energy out of the air. I don't look away from whatever has control of the husk that was my boyfriend. Come on, look at it, you like it, he says with a sick face sinister smile that's somehow too perfect and innocent. Still, I don't look, keep my eyes on whatever has entered my dream and taking the form of my love. I feel like my continued existence depends on my careful measured calculated response to what is happening. 
whatever was approaching out of my sight and sucking all of the energy, stopped, just a few feet away, and my husk of a boyfriend says slowly, No matter, wake up and look over at your dresser, you have company. I waken suddenly and exhaled in relief, remaining still. Just a dream, I thought. Everything is alright. It was just a dream. It can come here and hurt you, I thought. Then, I felt it again. The air got heavy, like a leaden blanket had been laid over me, and I had a profound sense of not being alone. I could not move a muscle. I look over the room, moving only my eyes, even moving my head is difficult. Not that I had any inclination to. Given how heavy it felt and the bone-deep sense that any movement would spell doom. And I saw it by my dresser. Its back is to me, the room spinning as I look at it. Its long, lanky arms and body legs contorting spider-like and looking into my possession silently, panic shirts through my body. Ever have the feeling that you have seen something that should not be, but is? And even if there is a god, he sure as fuck isn't going to be able to help you here. I had that feeling in spades. It contorted in impossible ways, looking inside my open dresser and looking into my closet and wardrobe, searching for something. And it was real, and I was awake. This was not a dream. Those thoughts kept slamming itself into my normally rational mind, as I tried desperately not to make a sound and look away. Deep inside I knew I should not make eye contact or let it notice me. Just let it do its thing and it will go away, never to return, and you'll forget it ever happened. But I failed. My panic overwhelmed me. I made a pathetic whimpering sound, and it looked at me. Its head was covered by something that looked like a paper bag, or a purple sack. Two blacker than black round featureless holes for eyes, and a jagged black hole smile and that smile stretched white, too white, and its eye glowed, if you can call it that, but it's definitely darker than black. Somehow, swallowing light in the room into a rotating mass of something, it was like that space where his eyes were no longer existed, not in this world at least. A hole in space is what I could call it, like nothing at the void between the stars and seeing into an infinite black abyss that somehow illuminates you and envelopes you as you lay trapped in its gaze. And the smile stretched wider, and it silently mouthed something as it dissolved into the air. See you tomorrow, it said as it vanished, and my senses returned to me as the world made sense again. Gone was the spinning, nonsensical distortions of my bedroom, and there was nothing indicating I had a visitor. I really want to think that this is just a dream, and a night terror brought on by sleep paralysis. But, if all of this is real, and not just some dream, I've fucked up bad. I've gone there, I should not be in my dreams and brought something that should not be back, and even worse, I've done what should not be done and gazed into its eyes and let it know I'm aware of it. I think it's going to make me pay tonight. With what? I don't know. It came again last night. The breather. It comes into my room after midnight. I can hear it. I can feel it. A huge presence that seems to fill the room. It pats over beside my bed and lies down. The massive weight of whatever it is makes the floor creak. 
Sometimes, I feel like my bed tilts towards it, and I hold onto the sheets to keep from rolling out of my bed. I don't know if I'm just afraid, or if it really happened. It's almost as if it's created its own gravity. I feel the pull of it, the mass of it, like a dark planet, and I hear it breathing, a ponderous low intake. I lay in my bed, the covers up to my eyes, staring at the ceiling and listening to it breathe. The breather, there you go. I don't know what it looks like, I'm afraid to look, so afraid. I am not in particular a fearful person, but there's nothing one could do to induce me to look over the edge of my bed. And since I've never seen it, what if all I had to do is turn my head? There it is, right next to me, like a faithful dog I never wanted. If I turned my head, then we would be face to face, me and the breather. I don't think I could handle it. Eventually I fall asleep. I have a life after all. I have a girlfriend. I have to go to work. I've noticed changes in the apartment complex. No more birds sing outside. No more squirrels leap from branch to branch. There's just silence. It's affecting my neighbors too. When I leave for work, Mrs. Bean used to say hello from her balcony garden. Now, I don't think she even goes out there. Some of her flowers are starting to die. I knocked on her door one day, but no one answered. The guy across from me used to have a dog that barked all night, and that was irritating, but it's been silent lately. Ever since the breather came, I don't know what to do. How do I tell people that something is sleeping in my room? I've never seen it. I don't know what it is, or who to approach or anything. I just try to pretend it's not there. But it breathes. It comes in. I can hear it walking in. Solid thumbs. I'm not imagining it. I went online and tried to find something, anything to help. But of course, the internet is just full of loons and freaks. It occurred to me one day, that's exactly how people would respond to me if I went online with my problem and told anyone, you know. The thing is, I am not sure if it's going to matter soon. When I got to work today, half of the office was out. I asked my boss about it, but he didn't seem like he wanted to talk. I get that, you know not wanting to talk. I feel like if I open my mouth, I'll tell someone about the breather and they'll lock me up, so I don't mention it. Work was so quiet today. Today, it was dead as a cave on Mars. I went home, I could not think of anything to do, so I sat on my bed and waited until it was dark. Then I got under the covers and listened to the breather. It came at midnight, like always. I don't know when it leaves because I fell asleep after listening to that heavy breathing. When I woke up that morning, I didn't feel like going out. I just felt like waiting. I didn't even call in to work. I thought about calling my girlfriend Carol, but I just turned the phone off instead. I looked at the window and everything seemed really pale. Maybe it's just me. There wasn't any wind. That I could tell. About six or so, Carol showed up at my apartment. Just like that. It was so weird. Oh, hi Carol. I wasn't expecting you. I almost didn't come. I just wanted to sit at home and... Wait. I looked at her without trying to give anything away. Wait for what? I'm not sure. I'm in a weird mood, that's all. What do you want to do for dinner? I've got something we can heat up, I think. We ate. It was blonde, 
something out of the freezer. We made love. I don't think either of us really came. It doesn't matter. We sat on the bed. We waited. It got dark, so we got under the covers. To my surprise, she cuddled up to me. So I put an arm around her. Neither of us fell asleep. At midnight, the breather came. We heard it thumping up the stairs to my apartment. And then it came into my room. For the first time, I heard it snuffle, like a giant dog, and then it lay down. Carol was weeping in my arms. It's okay, I whispered. It's never hurt me before. It's not that, she said. I'm crying because I thought I was the only one. I have a recurring dream that I am a child. I was with my mother again, back then, back when she was at the most vibrant and jovial. But I do not enjoy the dream. I will describe it as best as I can. I am walking with her down the street. Can you say bus? She asks, smiling down at me. Bus, B-U-S, bus. She points. It's the big yellow car on the street. Do you see it? It takes the children to school. Someday you will ride the bus with them. I see it, the bus. We keep walking. Do you see the house? She asks. What color is it? I answer. Yes, that's right, the house is red. We are in the town that I grew up in. We walk by a park with a pond. I remember having picnics there, hazy, vague memories of checkered blankets. Yes, yes, I see them, she tells me. Yes, I heard you. I see the ducks. I tug on her hand. How many ducks are there? She asks. I answer. No. One, two, three. She corrects me. There are three ducks. I tug again. No, we can't stop to feed them. Now hurry up, we have somewhere to be. We walk for a long time, down a narrow road. We approached a white grey building. It looked like a warehouse. This is not a part of my childhood town that I recognize. The sky is dull yellow here. It's quiet. Can you say watcher? She asks, Watcher. There is no one there. Don't you see him? He sees you. I see no one. The person in the color gray. He sees us. So that we don't get hurt or lost. I struggle in her grip. I want to go back to the park, to the pond, to the docks. He won't hurt us. Don't be silly. He only hurts the bad people. And we're not bad people. I question this. To stop good people from getting hurt, he has to hurt the bad people. I panic. I saw him. I noticed him. And now he's gone. Where did he go? I get startled. There's another one. When I am looking straight at them, they disappear. When they are in the very edge of my vision, they appear again. I look around carefully, and I count. Yes, that's right, there are five of them here. Five that you and mommy can see. I am crying, the tears stream down my chin. You have nothing to be scared of, hold mommy's hand. As we get closer to the building, I feel like I'm going to vomit. Wa, chairs, watchers. Every time I wake up crying, I am a grown man. I don't know what it means. I don't want to remember my mom this way, in some twisted nightmare of an event that never happened. I borrowed a book from the library on dreams and what they mean. It is very helpful for other dreams, but I can understand this one. I don't know if there is a meaning. Since having these dreams where I am walking alone, 
I can't help but feel there is something in the periphery, and the thought makes me nauseous. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you liked today's video. Please leave a like and a comment, cause I always like talking to you guys. Take care, and I will see you all in my next video.